Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our session today, Benefits and Best Practices for Digital Adoption in Clinical Development and Commercialization. My name is Jennifer Royer. I run our Healthcare and Life Sciences Product Marketing, and I will be the moderator for today. So I'd like to get started by introducing our presenters. We have Tom Johnson, who's the Senior Director of Life Science Solutions at Exostar. And he has over 25 years of experience guiding process development and managing technology deployment in life sciences, healthcare, and aerospace and defense. And then we have Ellen Riley, our Vice President of Life Sciences here at DocuSign. Ellen has over 30 years of experience in the industry, serving in various leadership roles in IT, operations, HR, and consulting. So let's dive in here. These are some of the topics we'll cover today. And really oftentimes in the industry, we hear a lot about security, trust, and compliance in the context of digital adoption and life sciences. So we'll be hitting on a lot of those themes and then talking about specific use cases and processes in your business where you can achieve impact. And then of course, give you some guidance for how you can get started or continue your path uh, on digital adoption. And we always like to leave time for questions and answers at the end, but please don't be shy throughout the session. Please enter any questions or anything that's on your mind in the chat and Q&A window to the right bar in the WebEx console. So without further ado, I would like to turn things over to Ms. Ellen Riley. Ellen, take it away. Thanks, Jen. So um, we here at DocuSign make a bold statement that all successful businesses will be 100% digital. And uh, this, not, this doesn't only come from success stories with our thousands of DocuSign customers, but also through some very reputable research from Deloitte and MIT and others. Um, some of the feedback that uh, in a study uh, recently done by Capgemini showed that organizations that rank high on digital maturity enjoy higher revenue, are more profitable, and have a higher market valuation. So that sounds like a great story. Um, life sciences organizations have been trying to drive to digital for the last 30 years that I've been involved in the industry and have spent millions of dollars on that, but still are challenged. As we know, um, working the manufacturers and the clinical research organizations that integrate with patients, with healthcare providers, investigators, other partners, there's still disconnected systems, there's data that still needs to be printed, there's workflow, there's manual processes, and there's also not the best experience, even though we've spent millions of dollars in infrastructure and investment. Um, as well as, you know, to Jen's point about trust and security, making sure that we have an infrastructure in place to manage who we do business with. And that's really what we're going to focus on today is some of the um, ways that you really can address uh, doing business differently uh, in the clinical space. So recently, Drug Dev put out a study, and I'm not sure who on, on the line has seen this study, but really it shows that um, the biggest return on investment that uh, can really dramatically change on the way people interact and do, run clinical trials is really about using uh, electronic signatures on the trial process. Um, this study included over 572 clinical trial investigators over 11 countries. And um, the respondents really talked about the burden of how managing clinical trials are and what really needs to uh, be invested in to change that. And you can see some of the key topics around paperless clinical trials, electronic patient consent, all requiring um, ways to do business differently than just paper or uh, web-based forms. Um, based on our customers and working with different uh, manufacturers and, and clinical research organizations, we've identified four really high impact use cases within the clinical trial process that can benefit by changing how they do business, adopting electronic and digital signature technology, as well as move into an identity management process um, that really reduces the stress in the system. And that's really around onboarding investigators, 
the whole master trial files for clinical trials, the innovation hubs, the collaboration hubs of exchanging information between manufacturers and collaboration partners, and then the patient consent process and really improving this, these experiences, but being compliant, making sure it meets HIPAA and patient safety, uh, patient protection information, and meeting the Part 11 requirements um, for the FDA. So, but there is a risk in this moving to fully digital. Um, according to the National Institutes of Health, if you looked at clinicaltrials.gov, the projected number of studies expected to be managed by pharmaceutical companies in 2016 is over 208,000 trials globally. And if you project out about 4,000 to 5,000 investigators involved in those trials, you're talking each investigator really needs to manage dozens of credentials to access different systems. And um, I barely can remember, you know, four different passwords that I manage. I couldn't manage having to be involved in that many systems and that many unique credentials. I know Transcelerate um, talked about in their recent discussions that investigators use over 50 credentials in a 30-day period, and that is a risk um, in the whole process of going digital. So I'm going to stop for a moment and ask a poll question. Christine, if you could jump in. Um, so what initiatives are you investigating in next year for verification of investigators and identity processes? So if you all could take a minute to fill out the poll, that would be great. Christine, how are we doing? We're doing well, Ellen. People are responding. Thank you. All right. Let's see if we can get uh let's give it another minute. All right. So, do we have a uh an overwhelming uh feedback? Christine? Looks like the results are just coming in. So a lot of folks are saying that the first one, Identity Federation with single sign-on, looks to be one of the most popular choices. Um, second factor credentialing would, and digital signature services are tied for two and three there. So that's great. I mean, because that's really making, you know, Organizations are addressing making sure they know who they're doing business with in the clinical trials process because that's obviously absolutely cre critical to the success of the trial and the validation of the results of the trial. So I am going to turn this over to Tom Johnson from Exostar, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about how you succeed in really that digital journey. Very good. So thanks, Ellen. <clears throat> thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Christine. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining the session today. Um, definitely interesting feedback on the poll question. So uh, great to see some of the Federation uh, really up front uh, as that single sign-on experience is certainly desirable uh, for uh, all the users as much as we can from, for the different applications that they need to access. <clears throat> Before I go too deep into the dialogue around going digital, I did want to take just a couple of seconds and give those that aren't familiar with Exostar a quick background on Exostar. Um, we were founded about 15 years ago to support secure collaboration between suppliers and design partners in aerospace and defense. Uh, we provide identity management, secure document collaboration, and supply chain management services to over 500,000 users from over 100,000 unique companies. We were asked by life science community members if we could provide similar services in life sciences and began that journey, it was about six years ago. Uh, and today we're providing similar services to over 1,100 unique companies or organizations within life sciences and we're working with some of the largest pharmaceutical, biotech, 
and clinical research organizations to support that secure access and collaboration with their partners. So it's a little bit of that experience that we bring to the webinar today and this idea of how do we succeed in going digital. So if we start to think about what are the key aspects of going digital uh, and trying to get that value uh, out of a, a digital relationship with our partners, digitally enabled processes, we identified these pillars of successful digital strategy. Um, at the center of, to this is identity. Who am I sharing information with? Is it the right people? Is it the right information? Uh, I have the idea that I want to share with someone, so I, this idea of partnership, if I go digital all on my own as an entity, I, it doesn't really add that value where I'm really interacting with these partners that are helping me with research or trial activities. And in order to make that, that work, that, that digital exchange, that digital process work, I need trust. I need to be able to accept that I recognize who are the people that are coming to my service. Uh, I want them to do that efficiently through things like federation and single sign-on, uh, but I need to be able to trust those identities as well for sharing information. So if we dive in a little bit uh, into this concept and we agree that digital is going to happen, um, and we think about how are we going to embrace that, this first concept of identity is critical. So we need to set aside that old paradigm of creating a new user account for each system. So Ellen had a couple of examples. She highlighted the transcellerate statistics uh, from one of the investigator societies uh, that uh, this is a huge challenge. A lot of people have gone digital in that they've enabled their applications, but they haven't really considered what's the impact on the user community. And if I look at that impact, just not on the users, but if I look at the security impact of someone having up to 50 different credentials, and clearly those are written down somewhere, no one's gonna remember those, and what's the risk that those are compromised? Uh, is there an impact where somebody starts to question my trial uh, history information because this uh, login credential is available uh, written down somewhere in the facility? So I need to start to explore what can I do as alternatives um, from that identity standpoint. And certainly one alternative is to accept user credentials provided by your targeted users or some other party. The federated uh, single sign-on, in a lot of instances today, you're identifying key partners, your primary partners, and doing direct federation maybe into your services. Um, and when we talk about those folks or partners that aren't quite ready, to do that federated uh, SSO into your services, you may still have to find a way to offer them VPN access or a credential that you're gonna provide into your services. So as an alternative to that, you really would look to say, how can I trust those credentials from that partner? And if I'm going one-to-one, -one, I might agree exactly how do you uh, issue credentials within uh, your business, and that's okay for me. But if I start to expand that and say I now have 20 partners, I might have 50 partners that I'm working with across my uh, 20 different trials that I'm supporting, um, it doesn't really scale to do that one-to-one -one federation. So I need to start looking at how do I begin to trust other uh, identity credentials from across my partners. And this idea of an identity hub or a service that starts to provide a connecting point for all of these partner organizations starts to make sense in that I can have one place where I can go and connect and, and basically make a secure connection to all of my partners. And in order to do that, those partners have to come together uh, and agree that they're gonna follow some type of framework for the trust. Uh, so organizations like SAFE uh, and others really offer some type of construct for a trust framework that provides the rule set of how do I bring identities to the community? How do I connect applications to a community? What should they be uh, provided in order to make uh, secure authorization decisions to allow access into those services? So I need that set of rules and then associated governance and the identity hub would typically provide some, fr some process for that governance so that the members can really agree on the trust framework and on the working set of rules so that you can bring applications, they can, and your partners can bring identities uh, to the service. So if we move in and take a, an example look at 
we're of course using uh, Exostar as the example, as that's what I'm familiar with. Um, we are seeing an identity hub in, in process today within life sciences. This picture of the identity hub here uh, indicates um, on the lower portion those that are connected uh, as identity providers. So those users are logging into their internal corporate network and then they're able to click into one of the applications that's represented at the top of this uh, with that single sign-in experience. So they aren't challenged again for a login. The actual authentication happens in the background uh, through a SAML process or other federation tools. So the key here is really about coming together uh, and looking at that digital uh, objective and what are the pieces that are required. I need that identity and so uh, federation is certainly the, the recommended path because of the security that it offers and that you're getting a credential from your organization uh, that uh, um, provides the, the proper level of vetting and uh, uh, authentication within your own service, uh, within your own network and then that it's trusted and accepted by the relying party applications uh, through the hub. That governance that we discussed is really about uh, making sure that each member uh, of this community uh, has followed the proper uh, processes uh, and um, are the assurances there for the members to rely on uh, those connections and those identities. So we'll explore a little bit deeper as we look at those key service elements and how would you take advantage of those. So the identity provider uh, capabilities, we talked about uh, how you can take advantage of that through an identity hub service or you could do point-to-point -point federation with some of your uh, larger partners um, and you want to take advantage of uh, those identity providers um, uh, that can issue credentials uh, for that are recognized within the community. And as you look at the requirements to come in and share information with those partners and maybe username and password credentials acceptable, but certainly we're seeing a need through the compliance requirements and the idea of digital signing transactions that I would like a second factor credential. So one of the other keys is you're looking to expand that digital footprint and add different processes to uh, your digital interaction is to look at two factor credentials. Can I expand the identity that I recognize that's connected to my community that's coming to access my services and add in a second factor such as a PKI a certificate or a one-time password service on a smartphone, a mobile device, or a pushed uh, password or a pushed token for second factor access out to a mobile device. So there's quite a few options in second factor credentials. I think one of the keys that we've seen in trying to enable those credentials is to get them as closely aligned to the original identity of, of the uh, uh, user that's accessing your service and then also to try to provide those services in a step-up manner. So I can come with a username and password credential, but when I want to uh, access or complete a signing transaction, I can then invoke and, and basically on the fly request a second factor credential go through the proper proofing, receive that credential, and continue in my work stream with minimal interruption. Then we want to look at the, you know, the key in that whole partner relationship is what am I trying to access or what am I trying to give access to to these identities within my community? So I need to get those applications connected at, in order to support the services. So clinical trial applications, CTMS, ETMF, EDC, learning management services, those are all things that I need to make available to the investigator community, to some of the researcher community, the site personnel managing uh, the events. So I want those to be available through that single identity and that single login to provide the usability, also the security that I'm looking for. And as I start to simplify this, I end up with a single connection for each application into the community and I'm trusting the external identities uh, that I invite to get access to my services. I may also bring, you know, collaboration applications like a SharePoint service or box access, um, but, but others that really need to be part of that digital framework that you're looking for. Um, and again, the really starting point for that is to look and say, are they federation ready? 
Can I get them connected to a community service uh, so that I can take advantage of this community of identities uh, and simplify that, that access process? And then as we look at the lower right-hand corner, the digital signature service is uh, really important to get that end-to-end -end process benefit. So as we heard from Ellen early on about getting forms digitized, and but still there's some processes that exist today where I have to print those out to get signatures, I have to print those out to, to get to, to submit them. As we're moving as an industry into this digital world, we're going to see more and more reliance on the digital signature. Do I have a PKI certificate to sign that with, or do I have an accepted second factor credential within the, the standards for SAFE or others? then I can uh, basically perform that signing online and meet that criteria within the, the digital process. So partners like DocuSign are there to really enable that digital signature uh, service, and we're going to look a little bit more uh, at that in, a, in another slide or two. But I did want to drill in a little bit deeper in this idea of connecting to uh, the, the community and being able to take advantage of that framework. In this particular slide, we're looking at those that are federated into the service along the left-hand side. The members and community members that aren't quite ready for federation are in the top box here, and they're actually issued a credential from the community, uh, and in this case, it's a SAM credential, and they're connecting to the hub. And their experience is they come out to click at a service like Transcelerate, which is connected to this hub. Uh, and in the background, the Transcelerate service is going to request a, a, an authentication event from the hub. The hub is going to either prompt the user who has a SAM credential to go ahead and authenticate within the service, or if it's a federated user, it's going to broker that transaction and go out to the identity provider and request the authentication event. It's going to return that information back to the broker. Uh, which is going to, again, process a response back to Transcelerate. And in that, it's going to explain that I have this user, they've authenticated in this manner, uh, and their level of trust that's recognized by the community is X, and present that to Transcelerate to authorize access. So there's a, a reliance from a technical framework to get this digital happening, but the more important part really is about that governance and do I allow and trust that authentication that happened somewhere else in the network. Um, and then as we continue to look at this, you've got the DocuSign uh, as an example connected to this, to this hub. And from a signing service, as I get to that signing transaction uh, within an application, I then I, I'm using DocuSign who's coming out and asking for uh, a verification of your identity. And we enable that today through force authentication. There's other services that we can support, which then generates a challenge back to the, the hub for an authentication event um, that's real time to process the, the signing ceremony. So again, the broker would look back and if it's a federated user, would broker that request all the way back to the uh, identity provider and bring back an active authentication to meet that force authentication requirement for the digital signing uh, action. So we're just touching on that level. There's a lot more detail from a technical aspect, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of understanding how these pieces can come together and getting your applications connected, getting your identities connected can start to streamline this process and help you go digital. We did want to share just a quick example of some of that signing integration. This is an example um, of DocuSign and Exostar working together. Uh, we do this within uh, EngageZone uh, portal, um, and it, it basically provides the integration path where uh, an investigator, um, uh, uh, pharma resource can identify documents that they're required as part of the trial process. An investigator receives a document that they need to sign uh, that authentication that I just described on the earlier slide happens through uh, Exostar, and the document then is presented uh, in a user interface for the user to open and review and evaluate the content. When the content uh, is approved and the user wants to sign the document, they can apply that DocuSign uh, service within the context of that application uh, and the signature is applied. Um, 
So that's kind of the end-to-end -end access. So when that signature is applied again, if it's a true digital signature, we'll do a force authentication event and request verification of the, the user identity as part of the signing ceremony. So hopefully that gives you some sense of, you know, ways that you can go digital, how you can start to leverage some of the community tools that are out uh, here today uh, and used by Transcelerate and some of the large members of the, the uh, life sciences community, uh, and that whole idea of going digital together, that it takes identities, it takes those partners to be part of the framework, and it takes a trust across the community uh, for digital work to, to really work and deliver the value. So with that, I'm going to hand back over to Ellen, who will give you a little bit uh, more background on uh, DocuSign and kind of close out some of our conversation on going digital. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. So um, as Tom mentioned, as part of the overall framework, uh, DocuSign has a couple of options to uh, be able to support the signing transactions. So we do have a Part 11 product that's available. Um, we do have the ability to support third-party digital signatures, such as the Safe Biopharma or OpenTrust, and we do have a um, locally managed uh, certificate um, with our CoSign uh, product. Um, as cloud providers, both Exostar and DocuSign treat security absolutely seriously, and as, as Tom Base um, communicated, is. The security and trust is absolutely critical to us being able to support the clinical trials process. And um, we have gone through the most intensive audits of um, any cloud providers. Um, we are ISO. We really focus on ISO as the certified information security management process. And um, we've gone through, we um, support Safe Harbor international usage of our product. So. Uh, making sure we manage the personal data that goes across um, both U.S. and the European Union. And this is absolutely key in making sure that we're the right technology and providers, um, both the Exastar and DocuSign using it in the cloud. So um, I'm going to stop for a minute, and we're going to do our last poll, which uh, have you or your organization used electronic signature in uh, any of your clinical trials? So we'll open it up. It should be a pretty easy one. Yes, no, not sure. How's it looking? All right, looks like we've still got a few people left to respond, but a lot of people actually aren't sure. <laughs> Looks to be the overwhelming response. All right. Well, that, you know, so it's obvious. And, you know, to me, that's reflective of, of the reality of most organizations have not necessarily used electronic signatures to solve the clinical trial process uh, because of the lack of technology and um, the trust in the infrastructure. So with the Exostar solution and DocuSign um, being available with the Part 11 uh, capabilities, I think that probably is, is a justifiable uh, result of the poll there, Jen. <laughs> so um, just to wrap it up, um, here are some of the value metrics that we've collected across our life sciences customers. Um, and you can see there's, you know, error reduction, which is absolutely critical in moving documents and workflow making sure the data is collected right first time. And that's obviously, you know, I've been involved in pharmaceuticals for 30 years, and that's a mantra um, we've always tried to achieve is, you know, right first time. And uh, the technology, we've done some measurements working with clients that uh, we see in almost a 90% error reduction. Um, getting things move quicker through the process. Obviously, anything we can do to improve getting drugs to market means more revenue and uh, makes your company more successful. Um, and we've measured over three weeks in time savings with some of our customers. And uh, costs, reducing costs, whether it's records management costs, it's FedExing costs, um, it's moving and managing papers for signatures uh, back and forth between organizations or within an organization. And, you know, reducing compliance risk is absolutely, it's hard to measure, but 
making sure that all the documents and everything that supports the clinical trial process is, is um, delivered in a safe and secure collaborated um, technology environment. You know, the ability to avoid um, penalties um, is absolutely key and uh, share that data with external partners because nobody's doing clinical trials by themselves. Um, you're using third parties such as CROs, you're using lots of investigator sites and hospital systems, and it's really how do you share that data and move it through the process to support the clinical trial digital journey quicker. So I'm gonna stop, and Jim, we're gonna open it up for some questions. Um, yep, all right, so, Feel free to add to the Q&A or chat for everyone on the line. We did have a few questions come in, so I will kick it off with one, and, and this will be for Tom. So it sounds like we have some interest in the joint solution. The question is, how do we get started using ExoStar's Identity Hub with DocuSign's signature capability? Sure, thanks, Jen. Um, so great question, and I think we touched a little bit on that during the, during the presentation, but really that first step is to, to look at your, um, to kind of document your business requirement for collaborating with partners, and you want to explore the processes around the, those that require the signatures, um, and it, understand what are the signatures that are required, what's the compliance requirement, and then who are you asking to do that signing? So is it your partners, your investigators that are doing your trials? Uh, is it other research uh, partners that are doing submittals at some form um, that you need to work with? So it's really understanding what are the transactions that you want to, to move to digital signatures and who are you working with for that? And at that point, you start to look and say, okay, well, for those processes, here are the applications that I am um, utilizing for those processes today. Are they ready for digital signature uh, inter, uh, integration? And can DocuSign become a component of those? Um, and that would be the ideal process. And if not, there's a process that you can take some of that content digitally that's generated from one of those services and then move it into a process for signing uh, within a, a DocuSign service that leverages the, those identities um, from ExoStar. Um, so kind of breaking down your requirements, uh, understanding who your partners are, which applications you want to integrate, are they integration ready, uh, and uh, where do you want to move um, in kind of next steps of the, of the deployment. So uh, that's a quick answer, that's what I have today, but uh, happy to you know, go into that deeper for whoever asked that question. Okay, great. All right, I think we just have time for one more. So this one will be for Ellen and kind of keys off of what we were just talking about. So we covered some of the areas where DocuSign can be used with investigator onboarding. The question is, how are other pharmaceutical companies using DocuSign? What are some other key use cases that we're seeing? Outside the so clinical Ellen. space? I, I think it's it's broadly clinical and elsewhere. Sure. So we see in adoption, people um, start you know a lot on the non-regulated space in the procurement area, HR, the amount of documents that are needed to onboard employees, the whole HR provisioning and talent acquisition process. Um, we see a lot of paperwork in procurement. We see a lot of paperwork in the commercial space. Um, key opinion leaders and uh, samples and the Sunshine Act uh, documentation. And then we see people really saying, okay, now I want to attack the regulatory area and all the master service agreements with CROs, um, all the clinical trial documentation, supplier agreements, um, third party supplier agreements for you know um, contract quality organizations. Um, so you know, anywhere you see paper is really uh, where we're seeing. Uh, the other area which I, I find really is around uh, patient consent forms, and we're, we're seeing a lot of adoption there. Great. All right, well, I think that's all the time we've got for today, so I'd like to thank Alan and Tom for their excellent presentation, and thank all of you for tuning in. As a reminder, if you have any follow-on questions, you can contact us 
at webinar at DocuSign.com. Check out our website, and we will send a recording of the presentation to all of you. So thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day.